summer. I mean, I had. Oh, full. you're saying it's functional? Is that, are you trying to say how you're selling it? I am full. It's full function in the back here. SPF, you know, one million. Uh, so thank you, Mick. I'm, it's going back to my, you know, my Montana roots with a little uh, redneck mullet style. So it feels good, though. I like it. First time in my life I've had one. I'm, I may never go back. Okay, you were speaking to someone who proudly rocked the mullet when the mullet was the thing to rock. I mean. I mean, the the haircut known as the achy, breaky, mistakey. I had that in the 80s. Wow. Um, well, well, then I'm honored that you... Uh, oh, that no, you, I, I approve. That you give it a high oh, rating. Oh, no. If I, I wasn't the that. age that I am, I would I would, I would gladly <laughs> join you in that club. But it would uh, I would raise too many eyebrows with uh, too many people. It would be, not be age appropriate. So, Mark Mariani. So, a bunch of your Titans fans, you're like, Moonshine, you know this guy. You know Mark. Uh, seventh round uh, draft pick of the Titans. He made a Pro Bowl. Uh, finished his career here after a brief trip to Chicago to hang out with those Chicago Bears who, heaven help us, we have to watch tonight on TV against the <laughs> hey, command, hey, 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 the hey, command hey. skins. <laughs> uh, Mark Mariani, top five in kickoff return and punt, retarded, uh, punt return yardage all time for the Tennessee Titans. All time, top five. That's pretty wild. I didn't. That's a stat I didn't know, man. You, you just threw top a curveball at me. Like in I had both. no idea. That's pretty crazy. Well, and, yeah. And you and Billy White Shoes Johnson. And there was, I mean, these are like big time. And you're right up there with them. Mark Mariani, top five all-time in kick, kick and punt return yardage. Mark Mariani for a season. Because one day we're talking about Titans kick returners and who did this and who did that. And somebody tweeted Blaine to me and we're like, my guy is moonshine, Mark Mariani. <laughs> the all-time Oilers, Titans, everything record for kickoff return yardage in a year is Mark Mariani. Wow. 1,530 <laughs> kickoff return yards that you had in a season. And it's not close. Like you, wow. you, that'll never get broken as long as people live. And you're still the fourth highest punt return yardage in a season. And that includes like all the seasons that Billy White Shoes Johnson played. And they had a guy Carl Roaches. And, and they've had some really nice kick returners. You're wow. number one in Dude. kicks and number four in punts. And you never know this stuff, so I like telling you. It gives you. me the chills, man. I didn't know that. There was a, some some of those I had heard before, but, you know, to that detail, I didn't know. I mean, and it just gives – it makes me feel humbled. It makes me feel honored. I mean, I, I got here in 2010. Coach Fish, the stash, uh, gave me a shot as a seventh-round draft pick. And, you know, I just put my head down and and did whatever I needed to do. And, and cut day came, and I, I was hiding from did the Grim Reaper. From Waterson oh, dude, day? I'm hey, like, man. Waterson, hey, you're my boy, but don't mother come over to my locker today. I don't want to see yourself. you. I do not want to see you, bro. Uh, so anyway, cut day comes. I make it. They give me the – you know, I was so fortunate. Sometimes – sometimes – you got all the talent in the world, but you don't get to fit in the right opportunity at whatever level, whether that's college football or the pros or wherever. And I was so fortunate to land in a, in a on a football team that needed a punt returner and kick returner. And I got enough screws loose upstairs <laughs> that I like standing <laughs> under those bad boys. <laughs> and as we all know, as we're all finding out, you know, the biggest thing, you know, that I can, the feather, the biggest feather in my hat that I, you know, proudly wear is I just never turn the ball over. And I, and that's what just kept me around. And, you know, I was like a, I was like a cockroach dude on every team. A cut day was a scary time for me, but it was a seven-year run that I'm very proud of and honored and, you know, to, to be up in the record books with some of these names and to be a part of this organization. <clears throat> I mean, obviously, I love this organization, this city, so much that I'm raising my kids here and moved back full-time Nashvilleian, so you guys can't get rid of me, but uh, I'm a proud two-tone blue uh, alumni, and I appreciate the love, so thank you guys. And for people who don't know Mark's story, you went to University of Montana, which I I, I told you just before, I've, I've actually been there. I used to have a job where I traveled, and I got to see a game there, and I thought it was just the coolest place, and you're from the state of Montana, and, and you played for the University of Montana. Even you going to college and getting a chance to play, like, it wasn't like they brought you in and you were the top recruit and you immediately, you had to, like, prove to this guy, like, you weren't dressing for games in the beginning, we, right? You're Mickey, walk -on. we only have we only have a two hour show, so I, the, <laughs> I, I, I don't, I'm, it, it will be a long winded story, but I'll tell you, the Cliff Notes is, and you know, you know the rules. I was a non-preferred walk on. I was not a preferred walk on. I was a non-preferred walk on, which means there's a 90 man roster when fall camp starts. Once school starts, you can add 15 tackling dummies. The Rudies. <laughs> the Rudies. They're the Rudies. I mean, dude, when I, first, when I got 
my jersey. I was a blank jersey. I had no number, and I was loop number. My my equipment loop, my equipment that, that you hand in, whatever, was 100. I had nothing, and I didn't have any, you know, <clears throat> I, I just was an angry little Italian that uh, <laughs> was given was given a blank jersey, and it fueled me for a long time. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't be here without, you know, having been kicked down a couple times early in my career, but um, definitely it was a long road, but more, you know, more grateful when you're at the top after you go through that. But, yeah, non-preferred to, to my dream school, which was the University of Montana. And I like you telling people the story because – like, people who know you are like, oh, gosh, Mark's the best guy. Mark was all pro, and, you know, Mark was a couple injuries, or, you know, he would have had 12 years in the league. And all those things happen, and all that's part of your story. But when you, Because a lot of times when people see NFL football player, they think, man, you probably, they begged you to come to Montana. <laughs> and you were like a six star out of five. Yeah. And, and then they begged you to stay and not transfer to, you know, Idaho or Weber State. And, you know, and then... You, no, when you told me, man, I didn't have a number. They didn't even want me, dude. Here's here's the here's the here's the rest of the version. Is they offered me a preferred walk on spot. I turned down all my scholarship offers. I all of them like NAIA, couple divisions. Like we're not talking about. I didn't I didn't turn down you know Tennessee and Alabama and Georgia or anything. But so turn those down. Uh, got my classes. Went to orientation. Met with the football team. Met with the football coaches a week before camp starts. They tell me they don't have a spot for me anymore. They've taken the liberty of calling one of the NAI coaches that offered me a scholarship in the spring and said, hey, will you honor that scholarship you offered him here? And basically, we're like, hey, go go to Carroll College. <laughs> go to Carroll College. And that's why when school started, when I finally got on the field after Thanksgiving, I was very— After Thanksgiving? They, I, they wouldn't let me through the door. It's 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 well documented, and, and there there was a lot of respect and love that had to be earned for back and forth with my head coach, which took a long time. Well, I told you because that guy's back there now, right? He's back there. I and told you I would. He, he we we have mended fences. I respect him. Well, you're a better I, man than that, I am. That fueled me. That put so much fuel in my tank, and I probably wouldn't be sitting here having this lovely iced coffee in the studio with you <laughs> if if I didn't have that fuel because they held they they really kicked me to the curb, and I was I was not stoked about it i when i got finally got my jersey i was out there scrapping and fighting and getting kicked out and and so it was a long road man but in those moments it's the same thing as being a seventh round draft pick mm -hmm. you can't think of the pro bowl you can't think of a hall of fame career you got to think of tomorrow making a play you got to think of this week what are you going to do because you could be cut you don't get the liberty of you don't you don't you don't get the ability to look past you know, fall camp or spring ball, you got to focus on now because you don't, if you don't earn a Jersey for spring ball, you're not coming back, bro. You, you, you don't have any choices. So anyway, it made me focus. It gave me fuel. Um, and it's part of my story that I'm proud of and, and wouldn't be here without some of those, you know, having to fight through that adversary adversity early on. So, uh, and, and then I think it used it when I was, when I got to the Titans, you know, I just, I couldn't think of, you know, oh, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna start at, I'm gonna start at the Z. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a starting in the slot right away. No, I'm a seventh round draft pick. I'm gonna be lucky to, I'm gonna be, <laughs> you know, you know what they had back in the day? They had masking tape with your name on it right. above your jersey, and you know you made it when you got the like permanent sticker, and they put, you know, the one that you plaster on, and then you peel off, and then yes. that, your yes. name stays on your name plate. Yes. Yeah, so your name plate type thing. So I knew that, like, you know, I don't even have a nameplate yet dude so i'm i'm just trying to get a permanent nameplate that's all i want so anyway that was my that was that's what you know fueled me throughout and <clears throat> it was a hell of a ride and and i'll tell you th this this organization this fan base has always treated me and my family just with open arms and so that's why i got so much love and now I just, you know, I'm my job now is just to drive the fan bus, the two tone, the two tone blue. Uh, you know, I'm just a driver of the, of the bus, and so um, it's uh, it's I'm stoked and for, like I said, Nashvilleian raising my kids here and and uh, couldn't be more happy. What was the first number that they gave you? I'm just curious. Was it like 63 or something? I really want it to be like a lineman in number. Montana. Yeah, at spring ball. Yeah, 83. Oh, you got your number, huh? That's right. Okay. And then I right. switched back to 80. Okay. So then when I came here, I was like, you know, everyone thinks the West, well, and all these guys. Yeah. And I was just like, you know what? The first number I ever had was 83. So I'm going to take that. It was perfect. There you go. All it right. wrote Mon its own story. 
Mark Mariani, when he writes the book, I at least want to like <laughs> I want to write the forward for the book because okay. I'm telling you this, this. You just heard the very Cliff Notes version. Imagine the full book version. What that's going to be like when it hits the shelves at the Walden Books near you. So uh, Mark Mariani, storybook story, and uh, still doing great things here in Nashville. And today, slumming it with me for a couple of hours. So we'll do that. All right, here's what's going to happen. Uh, Chelsea Messenger is going to join us. You hear her in uh, gambling updates. She does gaming updates here on the Zone. And uh, she'll join us next. We'll ask her about tonight. We'll ask her about the Vols in Alabama and the NFL slate this weekend, like we always love to do. But after that, no planned guests. So we're going to talk about punt returning in the NFL and how difficult that is and second-half scoring and wide receiver separation and all sorts of stuff with a former NFL All-Pro and top five return man kick and punts in Titans history. Mark Mariani, we will be right back with Chelsea Messenger.
Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone. Not going astray here. Chelsea Messenger joining us for her weekly visit from the Daily Tip show. Chelsea, Blaine is out today, but never fear. I have former NFL All-Pro return man Mark Mariani with him. I know you're a Gallatin native. Maybe you have some, you know, memories of Mark Mariani tearing it up for the Titans back in the day. Yeah, didn't he return kicks? Uh, Am I mistaken? Yes, ma'am. He did in the Pro Bowl, (laughs) even. In the Pro Bowl? Yes. Did anybody even tackle him in the Pro Bowl? Mickey's my hype man. No, no (laughs) one tackled him ever, Chelsea. Go back and look at the touchdown records. This guy. (laughs) So uh, he's also, you know, quite a, a, a... you know, a gaming expert as well. So I, I look forward to you guys uh, getting to talk with each other about that. But uh, Mark is not only a former Titan, Chelsea, he is a former Bear. And his Bears, heaven help us, we are being subjected to this on national TV. God bless the people who schedule <laughs> Thursday night football. Because when the Titans were terrible, you'd get Titans and Jags. It's just where they just want games to go and die that they have to put on the air because everybody's got to get on somewhere. But uh, your thoughts on tonight's Thursday night football uh, debacle. Well, first of all, everybody's going to say, man, this game's terrible. Who would watch this? I damn well guarantee everybody's still going to watch it. Well, I'm going to watch it. Right. Oh, 100% that I'm right. watching. It's the NFL. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So let's look at this game from a betting perspective. We've seen this line flip all over the place. At one point, it was uh, the Bears' favorites. Now I believe it's the the Commanders' favorites. Here's the stat. Carson Wentz on Thursday night has actually been cash money. On Thursday night in his career, 15 touchdowns, two interceptions, 1,443 yards, a 6-0 record in six games on Thursday night, which is crazy. I didn't even know that. Uh, so maybe there's a way to play the commanders here. I don't know. It feels like a coin flip. Oh, wow. Well, I looked this morning. It was even. Maybe that's just, you know, him not being able to think about everything for a full week. That You know, that lack of time to prepare uh, must really propel him to big things. So any props that you like? Is there either one of these teams that you like against the spread? How would you play this particular game? Yeah, I'm going to either look at an under in this one as we see money coming in on the under. It was 38. It is now ticked down to 37 and a half. Primetime unders have been the play so far this season. Uh, they are 11 and 5 in primetime so far this year unders. Obviously, this is a very low total, but both these teams have had real struggles in the red zone. Uh, I think the play for me is probably Brian Robinson Jr., the running back for the commanders over his rushing attempt. Over 11 and a half. This is a pretty low number, but he only rushed nine times. Remember against the Titans, he was not very successful. But this is a different matchup. The Bears uh, allow the second most rush yards to opponents of any team in the NFL. Uh, And plus, what a story. Uh, And just one game back from getting shot in the leg, uh, he already led the team in attempts. So I think uh, this is actually a positive game script for the commanders. And that's the thing. You look at all these games, and Carson Wentz has been airing it out. But they have never had a positive game script. They've been coming from behind in all of these games. So if this game's close, if the commanders even have a lead, they're actually going to probably try to run the football, which is not something we've seen so far this season. So I'm going to go Brian Robinson over his rushing attempt, 11 and a half, uh, for minus 120 over at Ben and GM. Well, I like that. Uh, I do like that. Chelsea Messenger, host of the Daily Tip, joins Mark and Mickey here mm-hmm. on the Blaine and Mickey with Mark show. Hey, I, I, I don't understand. I do understand all the Carson Wentz hate, but I'm looking. And, and so I don't know if it's warranted or not, but I'm looking at his two receivers. He's got a pretty dirty two headed monster there with Terry McLaren and uh, Curtis Samuel. And I'm like, I'm, I'm looking at it and going, both these guys in their careers have been number one guys. Somebody's blowing up tonight. One of these two is going to have a huge night. Do you have any thoughts on which one of those two that might might get some targets tonight? Yeah, we had a radio guy from D.C. on our show this morning, and the talk in D.C. is, why are we not getting the ball to Terry McLaurin? He is the best player on their team, but he has not been leading the team in targets. I don't know what it is, but Carson Wentz is not throwing uh, these slant routes. He is uh, only throwing these balls to Curtis Samuel for some reason or another, but that has been a topic of discussion 
So don't be surprised if we see Terry McLaurin go off because eventually you got to get the best player on the field, the football. Uh, yeah. But uh, the targets so far have gone to Curtis Samuel. So I think if you look at it from a, a target standpoint, you play Curtis Samuel. But again, Terry McLaurin is so talented. I think they find a way to get him the football tonight. Chelsea Messenger, our guest. Let's get into some of these other uh, NFL games. We'll save UT and Alabama for last because I know you've got thoughts on that. And boy, what a what a fun afternoon this should be uh, with those two teams. Uh, Jags versus Colts. I know this one will have the attention of uh, Titans fans for certain. Heck, we may even be subjected to it on TV uh, in one of our time slots. But uh, your thoughts on that one. Do you, do you like the Jags to get the Colts cover maybe? Yeah, if the Titans aren't playing, what do we do? We bet against the Colts because we hate the whole, the Colts. <laughs> but also, the Jags have had the Colts number, 6-0 against the spread – uh, against uh, the Jacks, 6 0 against the spread against the Colts in their last six meetings. And last time out, a 24 0 blowout. Mm-hmm. And Matt Ryan has been very turnover prone, seven picks this season, going against the Jags secondary that has the third most interceptions in the league. And plus, it's hard to forget that stat line that Matt Ryan had against the Jags last time around 16 of 30, zero touchdowns, three picks, sacked five times. Uh, in that loss. So I like the Jags getting points here. We've seen this one shortened from plus two to plus one and a half. So I'll be on the Jags this weekend. What do you think about Giants and Ravens, these suddenly good Giants who went all the way to Europe and won one? No one thought they could even. Yeah, I think this is going to be probably a, a public dog, and I'll be riding with the public in this one, which makes me a little bit nervous. <laughs> but the Giants getting six points at home against the Ravens. I think I'm going to be taking the points. I think the Giants continue to be undervalued here as they're 4-1 against the spread this season. Ravens just 2-2-1. Two, two and one. And the thing is, the Ravens probably won this one. But the matchup that I'm looking at is, can the Ravens stop the run? Really, their biggest weakness is defending the pass. But uh, the Giants obviously need to establish the run for their offense to work. It's not Danny Dimes' offense. And on paper, the Ravens' run defense looks pretty solid. They're in the top third of the league, statistically speaking. But if you look at the, the big-name running backs that they have faced, Joe Mixon of the Bengals went for 73 while averaging 5.6 yards per carry. And then Ramondre Stevenson, not even a big-name running back, it's Pat, 73 yards, 6.1 yards per carry. So I don't think that bodes well going against Saquon Barkley, who uh, second in the NFL right now in rush yards. So if they can get that run game going, take a little pressure off Danny Dimes, I think they can keep it close. Do I think they can win? Probably not, but uh, I do think it's closer than people are anticipating. Getting our learn on here with Chelsea Messenger at Chelsea Messenger, host of The Daily Tip. Big, huge matchup in the NFC East. Cowboys-Eagles. Cowboys plus six and a half. Are they for real? Cooper Rush undefeated. Mm-hmm. Undefeated. Any thoughts on that game? And then I'll leave it wide open for you, Chelsea. <laughs> I mean, I only want to... Th- throw in bets that are solid lock city winners so anything else you got for me i'll place right as we speak (laughs) so anything else you got but i'm curious what you got on the cowboys uh, eagles this weekend in philly well first of all locks do not exist in the nfl so go ahead and you know think about that for just a second because there's a reason we love the nfl because of parody and because of the chaos that ensues each and every week but looking at this eagles and Cowboys matchup, I'm real tempted to take the points. But I think the problem is if Philadelphia can make the Cowboys one-dimensional on offense, which wouldn't that be the game plan, make Cooper Rush beat you? I'm not sure if he can. This Philadelphia team top to bottom is a very good team. But the thing is also six and a half points is a ton, especially in prime time, especially in the NFL and especially in divisional matchups. I think the way to play this one, is going with the Eagles in the first half. I believe it's minus three, might be three and a half, only if it's three, only if it's at that key number of three where it's just a field goal because Philadelphia, so far this season, has been head and shoulders the best team in the first half uh, this season, averaging 21.2 points per game in the first half and also a perfect record against the spread in the first half. So I think that's the way to go. Philadelphia has come out swinging in the first half, and plus it's a smaller number that they have to cover. And I don't know. This might be a bad matchup for the Cowboys. Mm. I saw some crazy stat about, (laughs) I think it's since 2016 or something, Patrick Mahomes has never 
been the underdog at home since he I, it was something like that since he's taken over the starting role, whatever. The Bills come to town to Arrowhead. What are we looking at? Do, do, does Kansas City have enough firepower to keep up with the Bills? Yeah, I think the difference in this one is Kansas City's defense is actually a touch better this season because uh, most of these games have been absolute shutouts. Or, I mean, not shootouts, excuse me, not shutouts. Uh, so I think uh, maybe you look at this one going under, which sounds crazy between those two quarterbacks. Because the other thing is, Kansas City would probably love to control the pace of this game, but you can't if, you know, Pat, if uh, Josh Allen just throw the ball down the field. I think when you're getting three points with the Chiefs, maybe that's the way to go because it is a field goal game, and I do think it is going to be a close game. Uh, but we are seeing early sharp money come in on the Bills, and maybe that's just it. I just I don't know if there are known commodities so much because obviously the metrics love the Bills, but they haven't really played anybody that's that great. You know, when we saw that huge dominant win over the Rams in the first game of the season, we all thought the Rams maybe were a better team. They're not. So uh, I think I would lean towards the Chiefs in that one. And you can rem- remind us about the blowout against the Titans as well. There was, <laughs> I mean, there was that in I week mean, two. We yeah. don't have to sweep that one under the rug. We, we remember it. <laughs> Oh, yeah. That happened. Yeah. Well, that game went off the rails. You know, like, it, they were beating us fair and square, and then, like, you know, somebody muffed a punt or something, and then it's just the wheels fell off. So I feel like that final score was kind of misleading, and there was no love lost, so they piled on the points. Uh, other games in college, we have a good slate in college. I think we have a lot of public underdogs that will probably be on. Uh, can we talk about Alabama, Tennessee yet, or shall I talk about some other games? No, you, uh, it's go time. It's good. Yeah, you. If you're feeling it, then roll with it. Let's hear it. People are waiting to, you know, yeah, hear what the they should do with their money here. Into the Mickey Show. <laughs> well, listen, this is going to be the biggest game for the sports book because right now they are getting a ton of money from both sharps and the public on Tennessee, getting that seven and a half points. And I don't know if things are lining up in a good direction because I don't know. Does anybody else feel a little skittish as a somebody who has followed Tennessee athletics for a long time? At some point, the other shoe feels like it's going to drop for Tennessee. But their offensive production, you know, it's hard to overlook what Hendon Hooker's done for Tennessee. But I think they meet their match with Alabama, that defense, who's been excellent at preventing uh, opponents from getting in the red zone or getting in the, the end zone, even when they're getting to the red zone. But 65% of the money right now in Tennessee. I think with it's seven and a half, you got to go Tennessee here. I think this is going to be a closer uh, game. And plus, Alabama's not worried about covering the spread. We've seen them fail to cover the spread against fellow SEC opponents. I know the question is, Bryce Young, is he going to play? Even if he does, I do think Tennessee can at least keep it close. So I'll be with the public and ride with Tennessee, especially if you can get it at seven and a half. Do you think that line is already taking into account the Bryce Young situation? Like if, if they came out right now and said he's playing 100%, does that line move a little bit or is, or are they expecting him to play with that seven and a half? I'm not too sure. And I think it's a little bit of gamesmanship from Nick Saban where yeah. we're not really sure what's going on. And why would he tell anybody, yeah. you know, uh, I bet he does play and I bet it's already baked into the number because Tennessee does deserve a little bit of respect from the offensive numbers that they've put up uh, and they've beaten some pretty solid opponents as well. And they were at home. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's built into the number. Chelsea, how often, because you said, you know, I, I'm going to side with the public on this one. How often do the Sharps and the public uh, align on just any particular big bet like this? Well, it happens. Uh, it's not all of the time, but we'll see it early in the week because usually – the public money doesn't usually come in until closer to game time. Like, think about your average better. They're not, you know, putting bets in on Monday or Tuesday. That's usually when professional money comes in uh, of these sharps trying to take advantage of lines. And right. here's another thing. Betting a game at 7.5 or 7 is completely different than 6.5 because this might go to 6.5. So keep that in mind because when it's at 7, you at least get a push if Tennessee loses by a touchdown. Mm-hmm. But if somebody misses, you know, a, a PAT or something, you're in real trouble, which can happen in college football. But, uh, yeah, most of the money's on Tennessee, and it looks like it's Sharps and the public align. So the sports folks will be rooting hard for Alabama. 
All right, there was one more game you had mentioned to me, uh, Kansas and Oklahoma. I know at, at one point somebody was reporting Kansas quarterback was done, and then he literally, quote, tweeted that and said news to me. <laughs> so it's, uh, what, what is going on with Kansas and Oklahoma's? Well, Jalen Daniels not playing in this one, but I think what this is, it's more of a fate of Oklahoma because right now I think Kansas is getting eight and a half, nine points. Uh, and all season long, Oklahoma has been overhyped. Only one and three against the spread at home and just two and four against the spread overall. Meanwhile, this Kansas team has a perfect record against the spread, 5-0-1. Oh, and, and that just goes to show that they're still being undervalued in the market. And from what I have heard, it looks like their backup, Jason Bean, who we saw in limited mm-hmm. action in the second half uh, last time out, actually a pretty solid backup. And we saw that. 16 of 24, 262 yards, four touchdowns. He did throw a bad pick, but imagine if he gets the first team reps this week and he actually has some heads up and knows he's actually playing. This is a solid Kansas team, and it's also the same style of quarterback that Jalen Daniels is. So they don't have to tweak much in their offense. So Oklahoma, I think, is still way overhyped in the spot. Let's take Kansas getting the eight and a half. All right, on the way out, let people know. Uh, you're at Chelsea Messenger on Twitter, of course. Let everybody know where they can find you. And I, I say this knowing as soon as we stop talking to you and go to this commercial break, they're going to hear your voice again because you do updates on the station. <laughs> but let people know the other places they can find you. Oh, that's right. Uh, you can find our podcast, The Daily Tip, wherever you get your podcast. Just search The Daily Tip wherever you get your podcast. Or just search me on Twitter at Chelsea Messenger. I think I'm one of the only Chelsas on Twitter, so it should be relatively easy to find. And once again, uh, thanks for having me, and hopefully the balls don't let us down. And we'll see. We'll talk about it all next week. Thank you, ma'am. We'll talk soon. Thanks for having me. Yes, ma'am. At Chelsea Messenger, again, host of The Daily Tip. Fantastic stuff. If you follow her on Twitter, she and her co-host do, like, things kind of cut up in little tidbits too so they'll highlight specific games or matchups things like that so they're always putting out information really nice twitter follow all right when we come back we had somebody uh i don't even know what this name means knock trop n-o-c-t-r-r-o-p i don't know if that's like a euphemism for something i don't know what that means if it's short he said mark kyle phillips yips your thoughts question mark we have a top he's actually number four in punt return yards <laughs> for the titans here all-time mark miriani Let's coach up Kyle Phillips a little bit next. Maybe he's listening. Let's let's have the all-pro coaching through uh, some punt returns. We'll do that next on Blaine and Mickey. Special guest, Mark Mariani. Now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, right? It's America's number one sports book. Listen, if you join today, you can get started with 150 bucks in free bets. That's guaranteed. All you got to do is place your first $5 bet. Listen, free bets, free back. If your first bet doesn't win, you just have to sign up with the promo code Mickey. It's a great app. They have all your favorite sports and anything you would want to bet, all the games and props and different things like that when you – well, I'll say this. It's super easy to use. Even I understand it. And uh, when you win, you get paid your winnings very quickly. Like maybe you're like me and you think the commanders are going to find a way tonight. I do. You can do it all on an app that's also safe and very secure. So don't fumble your chance to get 150 bucks back in free bets, win or lose, with the promo code Mickey. Make every moment more this season with FanDuel, official sport sportsbook partner of the nfl you'd have to be 21 or older present in tennessee first online real money wager only 10 dollars first deposit required bonus issued is non throwable free bets that expire 14 days after receipt restrictions apply see terms of sportsbook.fandle.com gambling problem call the tennessee red line to 1-800-889-9789 
Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone, hanging out with Mark Mariani. <clears throat> a little bit left in hour number one. Appreciate Chelsea Messenger joining us. So Mark will be here for this hour and for next hour. It's funny, we were talking about this. You know, Mark's always like, okay, just send me some things you want to talk about. That way I'll be fully prepared. I know you stayed up all night preparing for this. Like you, you always You know me did. too well. 100%. You're just, uh, you're woodshedding. Probably went to like the public library and rented a cubicle. <laughs> like back in the day at Montana preparing for those finals. Uh, but Nark Trop, I, again, I don't. You're listening because you said thank you for asking. Uh, I, I don't know what that means. I don't know if it's short for something. But it's like slang for something dirty that I've said. Please tell me what your name means, and if it doesn't mean anything, you can say it doesn't mean anything. Uh, but he said, you know, basically, can Mark help Kyle Phillips? You know, what's your advice for him? Because it it does seem like he's developed the yips. Which now again, we haven't seen him touch a punt in a few games now, but started quickly. <sighs> Yeah. Faded quickly, shoulder injury, you know. And I and and I don't I think he got his shoulder hurt on the very first return of the season. And no one's talking about that, but he's played through it. He he got slammed and he got up, you know, clinching his fist and doing one of those. And here's the thing, we need him back. We need him back. We need his mind back because Robert Woods cannot return punts all year. Right. They he throw, didn't come here to do that. Yeah, they He's, throw they throw slappies like me back there <laughs> because I'm expendable, dude. Hey, listen, yeah. I, the one of the most important things that everyone needs to do is know their role in a locker room, and, and darn right, I knew my role. So, listen, you don't have your number one pass catcher. I mean, who's the Titans' number one receiver, Mickey? It's Robert Woods. You cannot have your – name me another team that their number one guy returns punts every punt. Now, there's teams that throw you back there in special situations, right. in a clutch moment when you need, you know, Tyreek Hill to go return a punt. That's different. Robert Woods is now the main punt returner. You can't have it. You just can't have it. So we need Kyle Phillips back. Does he have the yips? Is it mental? Are there fundamentals that we could talk about? Um, I think I can coach up a punt return as good as anyone. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I and I and I could talk him through that right now. I don't know what the deal is. And I would say, I would say we got to start. We have to start from square one, which is. The job of a punt returner is singular. You hand the ball to the offense. That is it. That's what you do. Now, everything else after that is a bonus. So we have to start by saying, okay, we need to secure this ball first, and maybe he's looking to run. Maybe he hears the footsteps. But what I – I don't want to speculate mm -hmm. because I don't know what it is. I can't see where his eyes are when he's when he's putting those on the ground and I can't see you know what his I don't know what his process is but what I think would truly help is first you got to know you have to understand have an understanding my job is to hand the ball to the offense that is it if you return a little bit whatever bonus two the most important thing to me that guys don't do is when that ball's kicked you run to the spot. Mm -hmm. So what you see is a guy will usually line up on a hash with the tendency of the punter, whatever hash that is. And then once the ball's kicked, you'll see a guy, you know, mosey on over underneath the ball. The number one thing that I used to do is you sprint to that spot. Mm -hmm. You sprint to that spot because inevitably and every single time you can count on it, the ball is going to move. It's going to float. It's going to flutter. It's going to die. The last one he put on the ground, it died and he short armed it yeah. and tipped it, you know, but it can float. You could take it off the face mask, whatever, but you have to sprint to the spot and get under there because then it alleviates you. It, you, you can see the ball better and you can see a lot more movement once you're there instead of trying to get there. So that's number one. Number two, what I don't like about these young kids and, and they're kind of teaching it right now is I never, until I was comfortable, and this is what I would tell him if I was Coach Ock, is I would never take my eye off the ball. Guys want to, guys want to, you know, look at the ball, get to the spot, and then look down at the coverage or see who's coming, get a feel for it. And the really good ones do that. I never liked that. I was, ne I was always a feel guy. I'm gonna use my other sensory organs, and, and I'm gonna hear, and I'm gonna feel, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sense. I'm gonna do, you know. And the timing goes off in your head, but I'm not taking my eyes off that ball ever. Mm -hmm. I never did. And until he gets more comfortable, he needs to lock in on that football. And then third, it's a fundamental thing, but you got to square up. You got to get your shoulder, your sideline shoulder. You got to get that thing turned around. We used to, me and Watterson used to call it a protractor. You got a protractor going across the field and you got to square your shoulders up. If you're dead on with the punter on the hash, 
your your shoulders are are facing the punter. Once you start moving across that field, you gotta you gotta uh, squ- get that sideline shoulder through. I like how you're moving to the other side the of the microphone yeah. for this. Just, this is fantastic. Can you guys see this? <laughs> no. This is great radio. Um, but but uh, anyway, you gotta get and and then you're under it. You're square. And then you're locked in and focused on it. And at the least, you fair catch it and hand it to the offense. And I think he needs to get back there. He needs to go return some more. He needs to shake off these first couple ones because we need him. We need him. We've seen what he can do. And he needs to get his confidence back up so he can help us in in the receiver room as well. Because trust me when I tell you, I was more of a straight line guy. I wish I had feet like Kyle Phillips, dude. Mm-hmm. This guy, can he is quick, and he can straight up snap these DBs off in the nickel, in, in the slot. Mm-hmm. And I love his game, but, you know, you can't have it. And you can't – you got to have trust. Vrabes has to have trust in you because you win and lose football games by turning the ball over, especially on a punt return. So – we need him back. We cannot have Robert Woods back there. But more than anything, I think his confidence needs to be needs to come back a little bit, and and, and hopefully, a, a, you know, a little bit of his health as well. And hopefully, we can get him back because he is a he can be a game changer. I think he's the type of guy that's going to have whatever X amount of catches, but ninety five percent of them are going to move the chains. Mm-hmm. He's a chain mover. Is it third and nine? Move the chains. Third and six? Move the chains. He's a chain mover. He's a he's he's like I said, his footwork. I have a lot of respect for it, and you know. Wish I wish mine would have moved that fast. Maybe maybe I could have done a little something else. But anyway, that's what I would say is it's it's a mentality change. You have to understand your job is not to take it to the house. Your job is to give it to the offense. Well, I thought it was funny that we had somebody in the zone TV chat said what you asked that because that was a question I sent you last night. Like, hey, can we talk about this? Because if you are watching them and you see Robert Woods and I, Action Jackson is producing today, I know we got like 30 seconds. But the fact that he's the number one receiver back there, like you said, that doesn't happen anywhere. And the other thing, too, is he'll return if he if he sees the right. But for the most part, they're probably telling him, hey, just catch the ball. Just go catch yeah. the ball. We know you can catch it. Go catch it. You're, Jeff Fisher, who was your coach, the guy that drafted you, I heard him get asked this once by somebody, like at an event. They said, what do you want from punt returners? He said, a first down. Yeah, that's right. You know, I mean, I want him to hand the ball. But yep. he said, the other thing is, I want them to get 10 yards. I want a first down. And if you get 10 yards of punt return for a career – that's like borderline Hall of Fame. Double digits is what you're shooting for. And, and the other thing is, is you build confidence as you do it. So first, maybe for the first couple games, you're you're only taking a few catches. Yeah. Then slowly but surely, you gain confidence, and then you're then you're taking everything. You're you're not fair catching anything, which is where you have you try to earn up. The, but you got to earn that. You, you don't just get that out the gate. Well, uh, the gate is closed on hour number one for us. But here's the thing. we got a whole nother hour. Mark Mariani is filling in for Blaine today. you got a question for him. A bunch of you guys are fans. You're Titans fans. We'll take calls. We have no guest schedule for hour number two. We're going to get into Titans offense and what it takes to play receiver in the NFL. whole bunch of stuff. And we'll also talk a little uh, Vols in Alabama as well. Mark's excited about that game, just like all of you, and just like me, and just like Jackson, and everybody. Open lines next hour in football talk with Mark Mariani, 615-737-1045.
It is 201. Good afternoon from the Superbook.com Sports Desk. I'm Lucas Panzica. Tennessee and Alabama set for a 230 kickoff Saturday in Neyland Stadium. The latest on injury news surrounding that football game. Nick Saban saying in his presser yesterday, Alabama quarterback Bryce Young is on a pitch count. He is practicing some status still up in the air for Saturday. Meanwhile, Tennessee head coach Josh Heupel saying wide receiver Cedric Tillman will not play unless 100% on Saturday. His status also not determined. The Nashville Predators dropped the puck on their home season tonight in Bridgestone Arena. They host the Dallas Stars at 7:30 and Thursday night football Washington and Chicago going head to head a 7:15 kickoff. For all your foundation repair and waterproofing needs, visit ussTn.com. Breaking news at once on your home for the Titans and Vols. This is 1045 the zone. Awesome. Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone. What's up, everybody? It's a little bit after 2 o'clock. Blaine is getting some much-needed R&R for fall break. So, I mean, we have, you know, our defensive captain, Blaine Bishop, uh, former All-Pro safety. Why don't we bring in our, our special special teams captain here? Mark Mariani hanging out for today. Had a great first hour. We coached up Kyle Phillips. I feel like he's going to be fantastic for the rest of the season after the pep talk from you. But uh, going to talk a whole bunch more Titans football with Mark. But always fantastic to have you. Love being in the bullpen. You know I'm all re- always ready. Stay ready so you don't have to get ready, man. When I get that call, I'm ready to rock. I'm here for you. It's what Lucas Panzica says. He stays ready so he doesn't have to get ready. <laughs> so Lucas is getting ready to do his his – uh, update and I said you know, we were talking about it's funny when the Titans don't play it kind of limits some of our our headline type stuff this guy's not playing Vrabel says this guy's out but not only is there a huge game that we had Mark Heim on yesterday from AL.com and he said this week just feels different because it really feels like Tennessee has a chance and that everybody connected with Tennessee really feels like they've got a chance uh, and this guy's been a reporter for quite a while covering the league but there are some big injuries hanging over this. I mean, it, it, Bryce Young, who we don't know, but in listening to everything that I can consume from Alabama way, it's like, hey, man, that, that dude is that dude's going to play. So it seems like that for Bryce Young, Lucas. It does kind of make you wonder, though. Um, there's a report from WBIR. I, I don't know if I've seen anybody else report it. They're saying um, it's the one place that I can find. They're saying Cedric Tillman will not play until later. Not this week. And they, I believe, were all over the initial reporting on Cedric Tillman saying that he was very doubtful to play the Florida game. I want to say that was WBIR that initially had that. Uh, So, And no update from Hype. His update was no no update. He's not going to. Nor should he. (laughs) No, no, he should not. There's no reason. These guys are playing a major media chess game. Saban had his quarterback come out in full uniform last week. They announced him as the starter (laughs) in the stadium. That was amazing. (laughs) There's no reason for Nick Saban to tell us whether or not Bryce Young is starting. Make Tennessee prepare for Bryce Young and Jalen Milrow and maybe Ty Simpson. I don't know. But... It makes it interesting to talk about this game because you don't know how to frame it because you don't know if Bryce Young is playing or not. We don't know whether or not Cedric Tillman's playing. We think we might know, but we don't know. So you have to have like two separate conversations. Okay, let's talk about this game if Young plays and he's 100%. Let's talk about this game if Young plays and he's 60-70%. Right. Let's talk about this game if Young does not play and it's Jalen Milrow or maybe Ty Simpson, the freshman out of Martin. So you can talk about this game in a bunch of different ways. And I guess it's good for us, but uh, we don't know. We're probably not going to know until kickoff on Saturday. I think for the Tennessee Vols, it is going to be one of the biggest keys for me when I look at this. Again, I'm a bandwagon guy, and I'm looking at this as an SEC bandwagon and and a Vols bandwagon. I'm looking at macro, right? I'm looking at big picture. The Tennessee Vols have to have a confidence and a mindset Going into the game, once the game's kicked, once you get hit in the mouth a little bit, because this is the top dog. Alabama is are, are the you know top dog. They're, they are the bullies. They're the intimidators. They want you to the, you know as and they've earned it. And and they go into every single game, okay, for the last ten years with a target on their back. Every time Alabama walks into your stadium, that's your team's big game, okay. So from the Vols' perspective. I think their mind has to be right. They got to be mentally tough. They can't flinch regardless of who, of who plays because I think 
obviously leading up, you're going to have a lot of confidence. You're going to have a lot of swagger coming out of the tunnel. But what happens when you get hit in the mouth, right? Mike Tyson. Everybody's got a plan until you get hit in the mouth. <laughs> Here's what Tennessee needs to do. Don't flinch. You're not going to run them off the field like you did LSU. But you need to keep that confidence up. If it doesn't go right the first drive, if you turn over, if you get down by seven, the problem is there's a little guy in the back of your hammy, in the back of your head. He hangs out right over your brain stem. You got to make him minuscule. Once that big guy starts, once the guy starts talking to you, once Alabama, once that bully starts talking to you, then you're then you're in trouble. You got to have the mindset. You got to go into the game with it. And you got to stay confident. And you got to stay. If they can stay, keep the confidence, keep the swagger, and don't flinch and play 60 minutes, I think they got the Jimmys and Joes to get this thing done. But Alabama can intimidate you off the field if you're not careful. That's what I'll be looking for is once the, once the haymakers start flying, if you can take a punch and keep on rolling, and, and the Vols need to be ready for that, I think. So that was the conversation going into Florida, too, just as far as a mental hurt, hurdle, right? One win over Florida in the last 16 years, one win since 2004. It's probably helpful that Josh Heupel's demeanor, when you listen to him talk about opponents on game week, you have no idea if he's talking about Alabama or if he's talking about UT Martin, who they play next week. <laughs> it's been very consistent, which I think has helped this team. But that was a part of the conversation going into Florida, just the history, the recent history of the Tennessee-Florida rivalry and the lack of success Tennessee has had in it. Florida nowhere close to the football team that Alabama is. We know that. That can be left unsaid. But Florida jumped out to a 10 nothing lead in that game. Mm -hmm. uh, Tennessee did get punched in the mouth early in that game. They got punched in the mouth early in the pit game. On the road, 10 to nothing early. They played awful. That's the worst game their offense has played all season. They were inconsistent. I mean, Hendon Hooker's accuracy, drops, you name it. Uh, and they were able to just kind of stick with it and, and just find a way to escape Pittsburgh with a win. They were able to stick with it against Florida and ultimately were the better team in that game. You're right, this is a different animal. But I do think there's something to be said for the demeanor of Josh Heupel when he talks because I, it, it doesn't change, Mickey. It doesn't change one iota from the lead up to the Ball State game in week one and the lead up to the Alabama game. Uh, going into this weekend. So I think that I think that has helped this team just as far as whatever mental hurdle, hurdles we try to make up in our minds that we think that they have had or have this season. Josh Eiffel was a winner at the college level. I mean, a, a winner at the highest of level uh, for sure. And he carries that and he's, you don't, he's not Cliff Kingsbury. Like you don't see this guy and go, hey, look at this guy. Nothing intimidating about him when you hear him, when you see him. But he does carry a confidence with him. Here's the other thing. And and Mark said this, and of course, Mark played at the highest level, talking about Jimmys and Joes. Somehow, this Vols roster is a good roster. And some of the guys are left over from, you know, two coaching administrations ago. Not much, but the ones that stuck around are playing and contributing. You know, you the offensive line has been a real nice surprise. Mm -hmm. The defensive front gets after everybody. Ask LSU about the Vols defensive front. Mm -hmm. The funniest thing about all this is, is the NFL is full of Alabama receivers, and all the talk in Alabama is, gosh, if the receivers are only better, and the talk amongst Vol fans is, gosh, if only the secondary was better, that might be where the game gets won. <laughs> Something's got to give. Those two question marks against each other. Well, they're going to give up chunk plays against Alabama. I mean, that's just going to happen no matter who plays quarterback. Uh, Tennessee secondary, what they've done a good job of, because you're right, there's massive deficiencies. It's one of the worst secondaries in the league. Warren Burrell out for the season. Uh, he was probably their most experienced corner he's done for the year, but they were able, and they gave up yards against LSU in the passing game. I mean, there were several third down moments mm -hmm. where Tennessee had LSU right where they wanted them and big chunk yardage play. And they moved the chains uh, because Christian Charles, who's been playing corner for like less than eight months, you know, had trouble covering, uh, you know, Malik neighbors of LSU. Uh, but it's how they mask those deficiencies against LSU with that front. Five sacks, held them to 55 rush yards. So they've done a really good job of covering up the issues, defensively at least, with how aggressive they are with Tim Banks. He talked about it right when he got hired. we got to play offense on defense. And they've done that. They, they've done that. So they ran out of gas a little bit last year, and they were just getting worked by the end of the season. But uh, this front has given Tennessee fans a lot more to cheer about defensively uh, than it did last season. With that said, Florida put up how many yards of offense? Uh, 453 passing yards by Anthony Richardson when we went into that game we were wondering if he could throw for 100 and he put up 450 on him and, and Tennessee had to score 38 to get out of there with a win so we'll see what happens 
I think that's another source of Heupel's confidence, though, is he knows they can score 38. Now, can you score 38 against Bama? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, <laughs> well, I don't know, but against Florida, hey, we can score 38 if that's what it takes. And if I'm a Vol fan, I'm at least excited about that. They can roll in anywhere, and they have some kind of an advantage most of the time with that offense. Now, how will it work against Bama this week? It's going to be fascinating. Well, you watch it, and all the talk is about Tennessee's offense, and it's all about you know these plays per minute and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, on the flip side of that coin, what happens if if you don't you know take you watch it watch it carefully is you leave your defense in a, in vulnerable situations. You leave your defense in you know like you're saying you get gassed. You don't want to be going three and out when you're running three plays per minute. Once your defense just got a big stop for you and then they got to go back and take the field. But this year, especially when you compare it to last year, I feel like. This defense should be getting more, especially this D-line, should be getting talked about you know, just as much as this offense because they are dominating the line of scrimmage. They're getting after quarterbacks. I think, I, think the, I think the key is stopping this running back, um, um, Jameer Gibbs. I think, I think Bryce he Young— He leads them in rushing well, and receiving. Well, yeah, whether Bryce Young plays or not, I think this, the focus of this defense need to be stopping him and stopping his big plays, especially if he doesn't play and now they're really one-dimensional. But it seems like he is the key to this engine. It seems like he's the oil that greases this thing. Yes. And, and and that I think that plays into a Vols. That, that matches up better with the Vols strategy because our D-line can help handle that. And like you said, Lucas, masks some of the secondary issues they have. But this Vols defense, man, I think they deserve a lot of kudos for where we're at because – they get left on an island sometimes, and all the talk and all the highlight is is with the offensive side of the ball, but they've been playing lights out, and, and one of the reasons that this matchup is as big as it is. This is a huge game for Tennessee's linebackers against Jameer Gibbs. That dude is by far the most talented singular player they've played on offense all year. It's not remotely close. So it's about turning, you know, eight, preventing 18-yard pickups from turning into 50-yard pickups with Jameer Gibbs. Like, they're not going to stop him the way that, I'll give him credit, they stopped John Emery. Uh, LSU running back another former five-star talent I was worried going into that game LSU that they, they, they haven't been able to push the ball downfield consistently this year how much are, are they going to continue to utilize running backs tight ends uh, on dump offs in the flat and make Tennessee's linebackers chase those guys down that had no impact in that game for LSU on offense Tennessee completely cut that off with what they did up front so we'll see what happens it's an, it's an improving Alabama offensive line that had a rough start to the season but there's no question Jameer Gibbs is going to hurt them. He can line up in the backfield, in the slot, on the outside. He's their most, the most talented player on the field for Alabama is Jameer Gibbs, in my opinion. Again, leads them in rushing and receiving. Yeah. Pretty crazy To stuff. think his talents were being wasted at Georgia Tech the last oh two my years gosh. is abysmal. <laughs> Hey, man, Saban, okay, transfer portal, okay. I'm just going to get Jameer Gibbs, okay. I'm just going to do it yeah. better than you. Like, think Alvin hey, Kamara. Yeah, that's, okay. That's who he reminds you of. I don't like hurry up offense, but okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get Bryce Young. Okay, whatever it takes. Uh, he's like the alligator that learned how to, like, open the gate. <laughs> <laughs> the was just evolving before our eyes. Nice. But uh, Josh Heupel and his crew, they got a chance to uh, slow down that evolution on Saturday. All right, we come back. Malika's on the line. Malika Hold. She got a question for Mark Mariani. I have a question for Mark Mariani. Let's talk about the Titans offense and some of the things we've seen with that. Maybe some Titans receivers. Let's get into some X's and O's with the man they call Moonshine next on Blade and Mickey. Start your NFL week six off right with a no sweat same game parlay from FanDuel. And you know, they're America's number one sports book. It doesn't matter if you're new to FanDuel or if you've already got an account, you're going to get free bets back if your Thursday night same game parlay doesn't hit. Have a little fun on this Thursday night. NFL same game parlays, the perfect way to combine your bets for a chance at an even. Bigger payday. Uh, call me crazy, but here's what I'm going with. Terry McLaren. Uh, McLaren touchdown tonight. Bears over total points. It's not that many. They can do it. And the fourth quarter over for the game. Build one for yourself, though, or choose a pre-built single-game parlay in FanDuel's top-rated sportsbook app. However you want to play, you can bet the NFL on Thursday. With a no-sweat same-game parlay, just sign up with the promo code Mickey. If you don't already have an account, if you've got one, you're all set. Just sign in to see what's going on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Promo code Mickey, of course. Uh, you do have to be 21 or older. you got to be present in Tennessee. 
Three leg minimum parlay, dollar bet required. Refund issues, non throwable free bets expire seven days after receipt. Max free bets, five bucks. Restrictions apply. See terms sportsbook.fandle.com. Gambling problem call Tennessee Redline at 1 800 889 9789.
Fine. Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone, hanging out with Mark Mariani. Lucas is in studio, Action Jackson producing. You want to talk to us, 615-737-1045. We'll get you in on the Mark Spain Real Estate Hotline. We'll talk some Titans. Got into some really good balls discussion in the first segment. By the way, game day and SEC game day. Like, all of the game days will be there. There's just teeming with game days. Uh, let's take some phone calls here. Malika checking in. Malika, it's been too long since I've heard from you. Hope you're doing well. I'm doing well. How are you guys? Fantastic. I just like to give other people a chance because I guess being kind always, you know, it it's just good. Well, you call anytime. We always love hearing from you. What do you got for us Thank today? You. Well, it is a two-part quick question. My first part, Mark, is it's not that um, easy being a football player mentally. I mean, there's so many people expecting a lot from you. So what do you – what do you do mentally to uh, prepare? And my second question is, um, what uh, part, like, what part, what uh, part is the easiest of being a football player and the hardest? And also, what grade would you give the current Titans um, team? Because it's been a change. I mean, Brown's gone. It's who we have to work with is basically Woods and uh, Westbrook Akine and. Um, you know, Burks, if he's healthy. So I'm just, I'm just wanting to know it's not, you know, what grade would you give them and what could they do to maybe be better? It's, it's been like, we, we barely win these games. A win is a win, but still it's, you, you want to do better. So I'd like to hear your opinion. Thanks guys. Love listening. Tighten up. Let's Thank win you. next week. Oh, I love it. Thank you. Malika, huge Titans. Malika, you're the best. Thank you for calling. And, you know, I think to your first question, you have to you have to figure out a you have to figure out a game plan. You can't always be a yes man. You can't always give the time that it that that you know everybody wants some. You get pulled in a lot of different directions. But it, when it's time to focus and prepare and, and get ready, you, you got to be able to turn it off. Um, but I also think on the flip side of that, uh, being an NFL player, being being a professional athlete, there's there's some responsibility that comes with that to the community to to the people around you so you got to find that balance but it's you know especially during the season if your crew if you're if your cronies that are around you aren't giving you the time that you need to prepare and you're not you don't have what you need as the resources around you then you need to change it up but game time you know football season you lock in and you focus and all that other noise is for the off season so uh and then it's to to tennessee titans man a win is a win i had a old football coach used to tell me winning's hard losing's easy just go just go across the hall to that locker room and ask those guys um after a nice beat down but i love old coach saying the old coach but you know what man it's hard it, so so being three and two is a good feeling you know being three feet away a big randy kick away from beating the giants being four and one uh is is you know there's a lot of optimism but i but i see you know i i don't know how many more body blows that we can absorb right i mean we go we go into the season losing harold big loss now taylor's out body blow bloody blow body blow um we're, again, we're setting pace for using the most players. Um, 64 per John Glennon in yeah, five games. In five games. And all of our stats, I don't know if you saw Jim Jim Wyatt's article. It's a great article about comparing the 3-2 and two 2001 team to the 3-2 and two 2002 team. All of our stats are, are down. Um, you know, as far as the receiver, receiver room goes, they, they have, you know, when A.J. Brown leaves and, and we decide we're going to go trade, and, and which I think was the right move, don't get me wrong, but Traylon has a lot of expectations on his shoulders. Yeah. Robert Woods comes in. Nick Westbrook Akine is has been a consistent guy who can win. But you know, I think I think when you when you're in a room like that, when you got to spread it around, when you don't have that go to guy, what you got to do is you got to look around and say everybody has to step it up now. Mm-hmm. Is it is it going to be this guy that's going to have to carry all this load? No, we got this load to carry, and how are we going to do that? We're going to disperse it to everybody. Kyle Phillips, come on, baby. You're going to be our third down guy. Like I said earlier, you know, Robert Woods can run every route in the tree. You know, he's going to be your consistent. And Nick Westbrook-Akine seems like he's consistent and goes and gets it when his number's called. I can't wait to see Racy McMath on his football field. I saw him during, you know, Cardinals week and during Bucks week this year. This dude, just you wait, Titans fans. We got one coming. Now, he's got to get healthy. Uh, but you're talking about 6'3 and can run about a 4'3'8". 220. I love what he, I love his potential. To me, it's through the roof. But 
Do I do would I grade them out high? No, I don't think they get. I, th- I don't think there's a high grade right now. I think it's middle middle of the, middle of the pack. And I think you know I'm not going to call anyone out specifically, but I think as a receiver room, you got to look around and say everybody has to do more. What can we do? Because and I don't think that's just the receiver room. I think that's the offensive line room, the tight end room. I think the tight end production has fallen off dramatically since Delaney left. We got to figure that out. Well, I, I, if you ask me, any sure bets, Mickey's money makers before the season. Yeah. I told Blaine. I said it on the air. I think Austin Hooper's going to catch 65, 7 yard passes. He's caught like eight. I know. Seven, Chig, whatever it is. Chig is through the roof potential. We got to get this dude the ball. His physical comp in the draft was John U. Smith. I, well, yeah. See, we let him go too. But see, I, 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 to me, it's hard to point fingers. I, I see a lot of holes, and I'm not trying to be. Debbie Downer. I, I, if anybody knows me, I'm 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 a homer, man. I'm a Titans homer. They're gonna get my bet every single week. But I see some holes that we need to fill quickly, and you don't do that with one guy. You don't do that by trading and getting one piece. You do that by spreading that load around, and everybody has to step up. And and so, you know, I don't think anybody knows that more than Robert Woods. He's a KG vet. He's been around forever. He's a Super Bowl champion. This guy is a beast, but. I think our room's got it. We got to make plays. We got to make plays because right now we are playing with fire. The Titans are playing with fire. Now, I'll tell you this. I love what we've been able to do in the first quarter of football games. Yep. When we can play out in front, you're a different football team. Then, to, then on the again, to look at devil's advocate, the flip side of that is you're always playing from behind, praying that we can make a play in the fourth quarter to come back and beat somebody You know that we did a bunch last year. Mm-hmm. Instead, now we're playing with the lead, and our defense is being able to put, shut the door on people, which is a much more f- fun place to be. But, you know, coming out of this bye week, we got to get healthy, and we got to get back to it. But everybody needs to step up in that locker room because we got, what, 12 more games, man. We got And we got a rough stretch. But here's the thing. We're in the AFC South. Go win the AFC South, and then we'll figure out how the playoffs, you know, line up it has been amazing and 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 again mark miriani sitting in for blaine today people just hear like oh scripted play scripted plays i had somebody call me the other day a friend of mine's like just tell them script all the plays well i mean it's it's not that that simple as that but it has been amazing to see them there was a graphic that sort of made the rounds last week that they had the highest rated offense in the first half of games and the lowest rated offense in the second half of games i think now what they have uh Two touchdowns, this two touchdowns, fourteen points. I think that they've scored the entirety of second half. They haven't yeah. scored it all in the fourth quarter. It's brutal in any of the five games. And so Blaine and I were talking about this, not uh, this, the game last week, but the week before. So they run Derrick Henry right for three yards, and then they immediately get a penalty, or Tannehill gets sacked. It, it it's they went. They had a seventy-five yard drive in the second half last week. They had one seventy-five yard drive, and I hope I, I hope I've got this. They had one seventy-five yard drive. On the other four drives that they didn't score, they ran sixteen plays for yeah. a total of minus yeah. one yard. I saw you tweet that. that On was- four non-scoring drives, they ran sixteen plays for a total of minus one yards. In the second half, they've scored seven zero 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 and seven points. And like I said, in their previous game, they punted on four, a five-second half drive, 16 plays for minus one yards. And it was a comedy of errors. It was a really deep sack where no one got blocked. It was uh, penalty, a, a dropped pass by Robert Drop Woods caught pass. him last week where they ran a quick – they actually ran some quick game. Like, hey, Tannehill's getting just destroyed. Let's just go bang, 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 throw it like the Steelers did for the last five years of Roethlisberger's career. Just like bang, 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 get rid of it, get rid of it. And and Robert Woods, who's a fantastic pro, he did drop that ball, hit him right in the hand. Yep. So it's been a, it's been a mix of everything. Yep. So people just think, okay, Mark played because I thought Mark played. And I'm going to ask him. I sent you this message last night. What's wrong with the Titans in the second half? It's been a lot of everything. It's been a lot of everything, and and we got to figure it out. I mean, listen, think the, the comparison I'll make is a prevent defense. When you're up and you're trying to you're trying to stop somebody from scoring, you run a prevent defense. You soft and and you and you and let somebody march down the field, and then all of a sudden they just be, won the game, right? Well, maybe we're in the lead and we get a little and we get a little you know not aggressive. We get a little passive with our player. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is, but I think we got to stay aggressive. I mean, we come out of the second half and it looks it's been looking like a completely different football team, and I don't understand that. I mean. Derrick Henry needs to be running downhill. 
He cannot be running side to side. Yeah. I, I, I say this every week on my little show on, or, or t- when I hop on on Fridays, I'm so sick of seeing, think about it. There's 22 men on the field, right? 11 and 11. When you're snapping the ball from the center of the field, I don't know what our, what I don't know what our deal is with compressing these formations and putting 20 guys in between the hashes. Okay. 20 guys. I would love to see a run game. That's 11 personnel. Spread those guys to the sidelines. There's two ways you can stretch a defense. Width and and vertically, right? You can stretch mm-hmm. them width-wise and you can stretch them vertically. Spread these guys out. I wouldn't like to see... Derrick Henry's a beast, right? Two, four, 250, 6'4". He's got all the things. But he's not Jerome Bettis. And he's not, he's not, you know, Brandon Jacobs from the Giants, right? We need to scheme him up like he's, you know... Jamal Charles, or like he's like 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 he's um, um, you know Clyde edwards helaire where get him in the open field, mm-hmm. get him in the open field. He does his damage in the open field. He's not running through the a gap, running over people, you know, and, and and that's not his game. Get this guy in the open field. They're doing a great job of mixing him in the pass game, but man, when we come out in the second half and run just a gap, a gap, outside zone gets blown up four yards in the backfield. I'm just like, why are we compressing these splits? And this is just an opinion, but I'm like, spread this defense out. Get a lighter package on the field on defense. And if you want to leave a linebacker out there against 11 personnel, that's where my boy with the quick feet, Kyle Phillips, needs to come out and break somebody off. And and that that and then now you're putting the ball in their court. Does that make sense? It does. I mean, I just look. I look at it like, I you look at Derrick Henry. He's there is there are two guys that have blown me away size wise that I've seen in the NFL. Him, him and Cam Newton. Okay, those guys are both specimen. They're just you just look at them and like you're gross. But that doesn't mean you can just put twenty guys in between the hashes and just give him the ball and everything's going to be good. It doesn't work like that. Spread him out. Get him one on one with a safety. Let's see who. Get him one on one with anybody, and let's see what happens. So, but we don't anybody. We, there used to be a saying when I was a kick returner, right? It's you run to daylight or you run to mud, right? Mm-hmm. And you if the holes are all mud. Wasn't mud, Chris Henry run to darkness? Do you remember Run to him? darkness. Yeah. Cockroach. Run to, <laughs> yeah, run to darkness, run to daylight. Here's the thing. <laughs> Sorry, Chris Henry. Here's the deal. All my boy Derrick Henry's seeing is mud right now. Yeah. We're not getting any daylight. And and it's cool to him to, to do, you know, three yards in a cloud of dust three times and hopefully we can pick it up on fourth and one. That's fine. But let's get this dude some daylight. Spread them out. Spread them out. Let's get these guys on the move. Now you got to arm tackle this dude. Best of luck to you trying to de- arm tackle Derrick Henry. What is – and people, if you watch the Titans every week, you know exactly what Mark is talking about. So instead of having guys split out outside the numbers, the entire formation will be compressed. Even the two wideouts on either side will both be within X number of yards to the – is that done to try to have more people to, to block on a zone type play, or or is that just a philosophy where you let guys work from the inside out? What's the philosophy? I'm certain that there's a reason, okay. right? I'm certain Todd Downey has a hat on a hat, and and I'm certain that um, if he was sitting here across from us, that we would get an answer to why what you know his thing, his thought. I'm sure he wants to get. Derek in the open field. <laughs> I'm sure he it keeps him up at night. <laughs> I mean, his job depends I mean, on it. I mean, yeah, literally, his right. livelihood depends that's right. on it. So yes. I'm sure, I'm certain he's not like saying, "Oh, this is good." What's happening? But, but I, I would love to ask him that because, because there is a philosophy, and I think if you can get, if you can break contain in that setting, right? Mm-hmm. If all the guys are in the hash, and then you break contain, that's one thing. But then you can't run a gap. And by, by compressing those receivers, compressing those tight ends, running out of big formation sets like 22 personnel, 21 personnel, that's having an extra fullback on the field or an extra t- uh, tight end, what you're doing is you're bringing another safety, another tackler into the box. You're bringing another linebacker onto the field that's another tackler. Get out of here with that. <laughs> I want to see eleven personnel. Bring a nickel. Bring a bring a you know a uh, um, uh, a Roger McCreary type body. Mm-hmm. You know, even though he's a beast, that's a bad example because like he's a tackler too. You know, maybe when it's once uh, Elijah Molden gets back, that type. Of, but bring that guy on the field and let's let's let him go one on one. You know, let's let's mix it up a little bit. And that's my frustration is watching these negative runs, uh, the, these runs of you know one or no yards. And and especially for some reason in the second half, I just it's a very different 
feeling when we come out of the locker room this year? Um, and, and do I, I don't have the answer, but I think that that would help. I think getting, getting Derek a little bit of daylight is, uh, would be a medicine everyone would be willing to take right now. So, um, and then the receivers, everybody's got to step up and make a play and execute and penalties. And, um, there you go. 12 in a row. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that. Boy, that was, that was some breaking down right there. We got phone calls that want to join the discussion. Rob in Nashville up next on the Mark Spain Real Estate Hotline. Mark, say hello to uh, – Rob, say hello to Mark Mariani. Hey, how you doing today? Hey, w- Rob, what's shaking? All right, I got a quick question there. Uh, well, I guess I'm going to ask you or anybody out there. Now, <clears throat> every year uh, – Everyone is always saying the Titans always, you know, got a lot of people that's on the injury report. And this is like it's beginning before the season even starts. Now, is that because you think maybe that they are not being conditioned well enough? I mean, because it's, I mean, if you got all these people and it's, and this been going on for two years, I mean, what good is it? when it's time to play the game and then they are always, you know, not absent. Appreciate I mean, should they? I don't know. That's it. I appreciate I, the phone call, Rob. Thank I, you. I can almost assure you there's some internal scouting going on there. Um, Cause I agree with you. And I think a lot of teams are fighting it. We seem to be fighting it a lot more uh, soft tissue injuries with the new, mandatory schedule with the NFL and NFLPA. There's a lot less we're doing on the field. There's a lot less, you know, one less precinct game and, and a lot less time under tension, a lot less. So then the soft tissue injuries. Hardly any padded practices. That's and right. It was all, and for people to go, why? Well, it was collectively bargained. That's right. The, the players and the owners, the players said we want to be on the field less in pads. And, and so all, all that is bargained. That's all agreed upon. And, and it's not. I'm not taking this out. I'm saying there's pros and cons. And one of the cons are that your muscles don't fire. I mean, there's a different in game speed. As, as a receiver, I'll give you an example. Like when you're running a full speed route 60 times in a game or, or 40 times in a game, it's hard to emulate that during a practice that you're only on the field for an hour and 25 minutes and right. whatever. So then you get out there and you, and you, and you exhaust some muscle. Anyway. Pros and cons to that, but I think there's definitely some internal scouting going on on why is this happening to us? What can we do to 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 help that moving forward? But I'll tell you this: I gotta give I gotta give Rabe some some kudos because you cannot plug and play on, on the offensive or defensive side of the ball. You cannot pu- plug and play guys like this and have success unless you have an established identity and established culture. Mm-hmm. Guys come into this locker room. There's no question what the culture is. There's no question what the identity is. There's not. There's no question who who's racing into the battle with the flag, and that's Graves. Mm-hmm. And he has he has made it that way so that a defensive guy comes. I'm not. I'm not questioning that. I know what the culture is around here. That's why I can plug in. Sure, I got to figure out my X's and O's and get the calls and all that. But Vrabes has done an insane job of guys walking in the door. You know what the attitude is. You know what we're doing when we take the field, and that's inflicting pain on other guys. And we're going to play that way on both sides of the ball, and they fit right in. So, I mean, he he's done a great job. That's why we are able to continue to run guys through. Uh, you know, 67 so far playing on Sundays. But I'm telling you, it's we're playing with fire. We're playing with fire. This bye week came too early for us to be doing that for 12 more games. Phone lines are lighting up. Let's talk, uh, let's talk to a couple more people before we got to go. We got one more segment left with Mark Mariani, former Tennessee Titan and Chicago Bear receiver and return man. One more segment with him coming up.
Blaine and Mickey, 104.5 The Zone. Jackson be, with the Beach Boys. Is my mother-in-law in the room in there? That's her favorite band. Uh, my mother-in-law won't be at the hockey game, but you could be. Hockey is back. Smashville, are you ready? Be caller five now for your chance to win tickets. Oh, is this tonight? Tonight, Bridgestone Arena. See the Preds take on uh, the Dallas Stars once again tonight. Don't miss out on the five home games scheduled during the month of October. Caller five now, 615-737-1045. Ooh, that's going to be fun. Get on that phone. All right, we're going to take these calls, but you got something you want to bring up? Oh, what's that? Oh, what is that? Oh, no, who didn't turn that? Oh, you know what that is? That's the alarm, baby. Tennessee Vols. Oh, hey, you know what time it is? There's all talk leading up to the big game, but when it comes to the final 48, we are inside the final 48. Okay, baby. okay. Let's go. It is time to lock in, strap in, finish your preparation, finish your last <laughs> film study, and start getting your woo saw, baby. It is the final 48, baby. The alarm clock has sounded, and it is almost it is almost game. We are inside it. It is 237 kickoff on Saturday afternoon, and we are inside the final 48. Lock in, Vols! Let's go! You heard it, Vols. Let's take a couple of these phone calls. People are locked in. Joe in Nashville locked in. Wants to uh, squeeze in a quick phone call on the Mark Spain Real Estate Hotline. What's up, Joe? Joe, you there, buddy? Uh, Joe, hey, yeah, we're, we're getting you. You're just cutting in and out. Maybe we got you. What's going on? I just thought based on what Mark had saying, uh, I have two plays that they that I think run, which is I think they're a quick shotgun with uh with uh Jerry Kennedy uh on the side and just as soon as they take the ball just pass it to the left side. There's an open space right there. And then uh, Malik Willis to do like a little package with him and do like a uh, a little flip a flip out to uh to Derek Henry on that on a little option play. Oh, Joe wants to. Sorry, Joe, we're having a hard time hearing you, man. Joe, Joe wants the rookie quarterback in there to run a package. <laughs> well, I mean, here's the deal. As we as we said earlier, I think Todd Dowdy uh, probably spends spends a lot of time, you know, figure trying to figure out ways to get Derrick Henry some some daylight. So, but I agree with you, man. That's all we need. It's, it seems easy. Just get him in the open field. That's 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 easy. Just figure it out, man. <sighs> What's the? It was Coach Mack or Blaine or both of them said this last week. I was telling you this during the break. Their thing is, he needs four steps. Find a way to get him four steps. If he can get four steps, then he's running full speed. This is a giant superhuman. Then running full speed in the open field. And as you said, and we were talking in the break, you said really. I, I was trying to say, Eddie George is is the guy. Like you hand Eddie George the the ball, and it doesn't matter how many people are on the line of scrimmage. He, he can bang into people now. Go back and watch how fast Eddie was, too. Like, in yeah. the beginning, he could run over you or around you, and he could outrun you. You know, ask the Colts in the playoffs on the Super Bowl run. He outran the whole team and watched them running behind him on the Jumbotron as he ran. What an absolute savage. Boy, well, he was a savage. And I agree with the four steps analysis, but I, and I also think it comes to, just comes to the open field daylight. It's, it's it, We're all saying the same thing. And to me, it's not about getting up to speed. I, I think he can hit it. What I think it is is his vision. He needs to see where guys are coming at him from. You know, he needs to see who he's trying to make miss and who he's going to throw that nasty stiff arm at. And, and 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 you know, he needs to see where that contain is and who he needs to beat. When it's so muddy, it's just hard for him to get a feel for where they're coming from. Mm-hmm. When, like what we talked about during the break, his vision is on the whole. He's looking at the, this whole field, but he's got twenty guys he's trying to sort out, and then he's got these little nip you know nipping safeties that come and take his legs out and he doesn't see it's just it's hard and i just think we need to scheme him up like a light-footed you know back that that needs space instead of a big bruiser which because i think he's more of a finesse guy i heard a guy on nfl network and i'll try to find it comparing him to eric dickerson okay eric dickerson was one of the smoothest runners he wasn't running over anybody Mm -mm. i mean he he could but he was smooth and shifty you never got a you never got a square hit on eric dickerson he was was, the knock on him was that he was so tall and he ran straight up was that someone was going to hurt him and 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 no one ever did he played like 13 you don't get a square shot on him because he's just smooth and he looked like he was in slow motion Mm -hmm. that's Derek. he is the same way you know he he needs space and he needs to be able to flow in and out of those cuts And, and i just think 
getting him that space is going to benefit us uh, well. But I, I know Downing knows that. It's just trying to get that done is a little bit probably easier said than done. Uh, just a minute or, or so left. Mark Miriani doing a great job hanging out for Blaine today. Trade deadline is coming up. Uh, a lot of Titans fans want D- DJ Moore from the Panthers. Uh, his cap number would mean anything this year, but it'd be like 20 and then 16 and then 16. And um, the cap number, it, you can figure that out. It's going to go up because they're literally printing money. It's a billion dollar industry. I'm more worried about Tannehill's health and well-being. If yeah. I was going to trade for anybody, honestly, I might try to find somebody just to go out there and try to help the offensive line. We we need help up front. I mean, losing losing Taylor what was about as bad of a blow as we could get. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, besides a, a Derrick Henry loss or something like that. You know, after we lose Harold to lose lose Taylor. You know, none of this stuff to me is going to work unless you can block it. And so we could get receiver help. That'd be great. But I'm with you, Mickey. I, I, we need to see some old line. And let's get the ball to Chig, man. He is such a savage. We need some tight end production. So offensive line, I would go to first if I could pick up a, a, a BA um, free agent or, or trade for somebody. We need help up front big time. Time for us to go. 3HL is coming up next. Mark, fantastic stuff. Thank you for hanging out today. Appreciate you, man. Thank you for leaving me in the bullpen, man. I didn't get cut yet. Let's go. And as Blaine and I say, in the meantime, in between time, peace. Peace.